Father, once again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be here. And Lord, we pray that you would just continue to be with us. And as we look into your word, Lord, challenge us, and convict us, and encourage us. And so, Father, I pray that we would have open hearts and open minds uh, to what you have to say to us today through your word. Again, thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated and cover your eyes as once again the lights come on. And open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> as we look at, once again, the church, an overview. I started this series last week and eventually we'll get to the book of Acts and look at um, the example that the book of Acts has for us of what a church is. Um, but these first two sermons last week and today are just kind of an overview of the church. If we're honest with ourselves or at least if you think about it long enough and if we're honest enough... Um, we will admit that the church in the United States has taken a beating lately. Um, I think there's several reasons why, and I don't want to get into all of them, but, you know, it's kind of odd, at least from my perspective, that, um, you know, people all over the world look to the church in the United States as an example of uh, other churches around the world, when in reality it may need to be uh, the opposite. But the church has taken a beating Lately, some of it is normal and is to be expected because uh, we are we we stand against the world and and Jesus said if the world hated me it will also hate you and so there's always going to be that that conflict between uh, the body of Christ or people who are who are striving to uphold biblical standards and then uh, the world which is based in secularism and humanism as well and so that's to be expected and 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 there's not a whole lot we can do about that but there's also a lot of it has been our own fault as a church. Um, and it's because I think of our own hypocrisy. I think all of us, if you've been in church for any amount of time, uh, you have seen that hypocrisy and you hear other people who say they don't want to go to church anymore uh, because all the people at the church uh, seem to be a bunch of hypocrites. And then society as a whole uh, see churches kind of standing up for one thing and then not for another. For an example, and this is just an example that, that has, has come on the press or been in social media just the last uh, couple of days. There was this group of bishops, Catholic bishops, who because of President Biden's particular uh, stand on abortion, these particular bishops uh, have said that they would not uh, give him communion or he should be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. And he's a faithful Catholic, goes to Mass at least once a week. Uh, but, they, but they're saying that he should not be administered communion. Now, I have problems with that anyway because if, if Jesus gave communion to Judas Iscariot, well then you know, anybody can take uh, a communion based uh, based on that, but then the hypocrisy people will say is, is that you know well okay uh, well then what about these politicians who are pushing who are Catholic but who are for the death penalty shouldn't they be excluded from communion as well and so the world sees that type of hypocrisy uh, in the church or how can you how can you say that you're the church and you love Jesus but yet but yet there are these other things going on with with sexual abuse and and even physical abuse within the churches and so. That's kind of our own fault, so to speak, that we don't take a stand. The Southern Baptist Convention was in the news a lot because of their um, uh, seemingly refusal to take a strong stand against their own uh, denomination and some of the sexual abuse that had been going on in, in their midst. And so some of this beating is because we're in a spiritual warfare, but some of it is because uh, it's our own fault and because of our own hypocrisy. So I would go as far to say that the evangelical church in the United States is really just not in a healthy place right now. And I shared that cartoon last week uh, that shows the church going to the doctor and obviously the church is sick. We are infected as in, in our culture, in the church, we're infected with consumerism and, and celebrity worship. Um, we seem to be more in love with political power than humble service. Uh, of, of just reaching out to, to, to those who need it. And in a very real sense, we are the church of Laodicea, which is described in the book of Revelation, 
on the outside, and by church I mean the capital C church, you know, churches across the United States. On the outside we look healthy, but on the inside we are sick. In her book, The Great Emergence, religious writer Phyllis Tickle, who passed away several years ago, but she said this in her book. She said, every 500 years, the church cleans out its attic and has a great rummage sale. With the point being that every 500 years, the church has collected a lot of stuff and a lot of junk. And we have to kind of get rid of all of that. And we're in the middle of one of those 500-year periods, if you look at church history as a whole. Now, Jesus would describe this time as the gardener um, pruning the vine. And it can be difficult and it can be uncomfortable, but in the long run, it's for the vine's good that the vine is pruned back. And so last week, based on some of those things, I started just a new sermon series. Uh, the title of the whole sermon series is Church Health Principles from the Story of Acts. And again, eventually we'll get to the book of Acts, but these first two sermons were just kind of background about the church as a whole and what the Bible says about the church. And so last week I gave this definition. Ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church, the church refers to people, not buildings and not organizations, but people that have been called out and assembled together to proclaim and live out the present reality and future hope of God's kingdom made available through faith in Jesus Christ. Now that's a long definition, but basically the church are God's people who have been called out to live a certain way in the world. And that's the church. Uh, in these first two sermons, I want to look at some illustrations or metaphors or allegories that the New Testament gives of the church, and there are four of them. We looked at one last week, and we'll look at three uh, today. And so the first one that we looked at was that the church is described as the new Israel. We looked at that last week, so we got three more to go. And so the second one that I want us to look at is that the church is also described in the Bible as the body of Christ. Speaking to the church in Corinth, Paul writes, Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. But now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be the body of Christ? Well, first, it means that the church is an organism, not an organization. The church is a living, breathing, reproducing life form. The YMCA is an organization. The school system, you know, Franklin Special School District or Williamson County Schools, the school system is an organization. Denominations are an organization. But the church is an organism. It's something that is alive. In the same way our physical bodies are an organism, so is the body of Christ. In the same way, our physical bodies are made up of many, many parts and systems, the nervous system, the skeletal system, the muscular system, all those different systems. In the same way, our bodies are made up of all these different systems, likewise the body of Christ. In the same way, our physical bodies function by each system being interdependent on all the other systems, so our body of Christ. If you have an ailment and you go to the doctor, you may be hurting in one place, but, but the doctor will tell you the pain is because of this. There's a breakdown in this part of your body that's causing the pain in this part of the body because all the systems of the body are interdependent on one another. And likewise, the body of Christ. We are, we are all interdependent on one another. The health of our church affects and is affected by the health of the other churches that are around us. It's all part of the system. And in the same way our physical bodies are handicapped when one part doesn't function right, so the body of Christ is handicapped when people are absent. The Bible says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so we had to uh, for a period of time, and that was the right thing to do. But the ministries of the church uh, continued on. But when people are absent from the church, it affects the entire church. You are handicapped. You know, you, you've heard me talk about the fact that I don't have a spleen. I had it removed when I was in junior high because of a football injury. 
And to this day, I have to go to the doctor uh, every six months to get my blood tested. They're always watching me because the absence of that one part of my body affects the entire body. And likewise, the church. And this was the point Paul was trying to make in 1 Corinthians. And so I want to read this passage of Scripture. And so follow along. This is the point Paul was making in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Paul says, And the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given to one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it should not be for that reason, it, should, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So, that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles. Also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with the gift of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And then in, verse, in chapter 13, he moves into the love chapter. And the love chapter has to do with the church loving each other. And so to be the part of the body of the Christ, uh, to be the body of Christ means that we are a living organism, not an organization. But second, and fundamentally, to be the, the body of Christ means the church is the incarnation of Christ in the world today. Now, what does that mean, incarnation? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 1, verse 14, or John rather wrote this, the Word, which was Jesus, Jesus, the Word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so the incarnation has to do with God becoming man in and through Jesus. God sent his son, God sent himself, and he became one of us. That's the incarnation. And so likewise, we are the incarnation of Jesus today. The church, as the body of Christ, is the incarnation of Jesus in today's world. Jesus is no longer here, but we are his representatives. We're the incarnation. This means that the church is to be the hands and the feet, mouth and voice, intestines and bowels of Jesus today. It means that the church, to be the body of Christ, means that the church is to continue the ministry and mission started by Jesus himself. Now, exactly what was the ministry and mission of Jesus that the church is to be, is to continue? Well, Jesus came proclaiming the present reality and the future hope of the kingdom of God. In Mark 1.15, after his baptism, he said that the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. It was the kingdom of God that he brought with him. And so likewise, the church's ministry and mission begins and it ends with that same proclamation. 
We are here to proclaim to the world that in faith, through faith in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. And so all of Jesus' teaching, all of his miracles, all of his healings, and all of his interactions with others demonstrated to us what life looked like in the kingdom of God. And so in Jesus' famous, or rather his infamous announcement in his hometown synagogue, when he was asked to stand up and read from the prophets, Jesus stated that he had been anointed, notice this verse, this is so important. He, he says that he had been anointed to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Those words from the prophet Isaiah were and are the job description of the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, here is what he would do. Preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind, release the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Jesus' mission. Now, we are Jesus in the world today, which means that that is our mission now. In God's kingdom, the poor, literally poor, in God's kingdom, the poor have hope of a secure future. And so Jesus said we're to preach good news to the poor. Thus, as a church, we proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news by fighting for livable wages. We proclaim the kingdom of God is here. We proclaim the kingdom of God is here and we preach good news to the, for, to the poor by demanding affordable housing, by feeding the hungry, by clothing the naked, by housing the homeless, and by equipping people to get jobs. That is how the gospel becomes good news for the poor, when God's people take a stand for those things. It becomes good news for the poor. And folks, if the gospel is not good news for the poor, then it's not good news for anybody. It's the poor. In God's kingdom, not only is it good news to the poor, but he says proclaim freedom for the justice and freedom for the prisoner. So in God's kingdom, justice will always triumph over injustice. That's what it means to proclaim freedom for the prisoner. Thus, as a church, we proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and, the, and believe the good news by fighting for prison reform and, and by fighting against mass incarceration. We do this by holding our law enforcement officers accountable when they do things that they shouldn't do. That's what it means to proclaim the kingdom of God. We do it by visiting the prisoner and by seeking restorative justice above punitive justice. That's how the gospel proclaims freedom for the prisoners. In God's kingdom, we will, we, we will be physically and mentally whole. That's the idea of recovery of sight for the blind. That's physical illness and releasing the oppressed. That's mental illness. Thus, we proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and, the, and believe the good news by supporting things like universal health care and Medicaid and Medicare expansion, by caring for the mentally ill, by demanding equality and equity in all these cases, and by visiting the sick and praying for them. That's the kingdom of God. And while God's kingdom begins with the incarnation of Jesus, it will be fulfilled during the year of the Lord's favor. And thus we proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news by evangelizing the lost and baptizing believers. That's the year of the Lord's favor. We do this by living a life that draws people to Christ instead of a life that repels them away from Christ. And we proclaim the kingdom of God is here by telling others how their sins can be forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. Proclaiming the kingdom of God, you see, is both about personal salvation and social transformation. In essence, as the body of Christ, we are to be the conscience of the community. 
And that is what it means to be the body of Christ. As his body, Jesus has equipped us and he has empowered us through the gifts given us by the Holy Spirit. And Paul mentions those things. I'm not going to read them again, but he mentions the spiritual gifts all throughout chapter 12. And said, this is how this body functions, that we're all part of the body of Christ. Some of us have this role to play, some of us have that role to play. But as we all work together doing what God has called us to do within the body of Christ, then we proclaim the kingdom of God is here. And that's good news for the poor. That's good news for the prisoner. That's good news when it comes to the sick and the oppressed. And that's good news about people who are lost because of the, the God's favor coming upon us. And so the church is the new Israel. The church is the body of Christ. But then in the New Testament, the church is also described as the bride of Christ. Now, this phrase, bride of Christ, is not specifically mentioned in the New Testament, but, re- but rather a portrait of the church as Jesus' bride is unmistakably painted. The portrait of the church as the body of Christ is really prophesied and seen in several Old Testament passages where God is described as the husband of his people throughout the Old Testament. Then in Jesus' own teaching in Matthew 24, a passage that we call the Olivet Discourse because he did this from the the Mount of Olives. But in his teachings called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus described, among other things, events that would culminate in his return. In the middle of his teaching, Jesus gives a parable, and this parable is found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13 where he's talking about things about his return. In the middle of this, he gives this parable about a bridegroom coming for his bride. In Jesus' day, Jewish marriages involved three stages. It's hard for us to understand because we don't go through these stages. But when Jesus talks about marriage and the bridegroom and Jesus coming back and all of that, he has this Jewish marriage in mind which had three stages to it. The first stage was the engagement. And that's the initial commitment to getting married. Now, we, we do that. Most people get engaged. Some people get engaged several times, and that's not what the Jewish people did. Engagement was as serious as marriage. But the engagement period, the first stage. But after the engagement period came the betrothal, B-E-T-R-O-T-H-A-L, betrothal period. And during that time that lasted for a year or more, the the couple were considered as man and wife or husband and wife. And the only way out of a betrothal was through a certificate of divorce. This is the stage Mary and Joseph were in when Mary found out she was pregnant. And so that's why Joseph says that he did not want to give her a divorce. They weren't yet married in our concept But in that concept, you were engaged. And then during the betrothal, there was basically um, a negotiation between uh, the the groom's parents and the bride's parents on how much money they were going to have to give the bride's parents in order for the bride to become part of this new family. But this betrothal period. During this time, the, the couple was considered husband and wife. The only way out of a betrothal was through divorce. But however, during this betrothal period, the couples resided in separate homes. They did not live together. They resided in separate homes, and the relationship was not consummated until the final stage of the marriage, and that is marriage itself. And a big part of the marriage ceremony was the bridegroom leaving his home and going to the home of the bride and taking her along with the bridal party to the place of the marriage ceremony. That was the final stage. And it was in this final stage that Jesus' parable took place. At some point in other words, see right now as the bride of Christ, we are in this betrothal period with Jesus. We're considered his bride, but he has yet not come for us yet. We live in two different places. But in his parable, Jesus said, one day the groom is coming for his bride. One day he's coming for us. 
And until that time, the church as the bride of Christ is to be faithful and prepared for his coming. Another important passage that paints the picture of the church being the bride of Christ is Paul's instruction to the husbands in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Where basically he says this, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her and will keep her unspotted and undefiled. That's a wonderful promise. That as the bride of Christ, Jesus loves us with a love that is characterized by sacrifice, provision, protection, and purity. And so right now, as the bride of Christ, we are in this betrothal stage of our commitment to Jesus and Him to us. And during this time, we belong to Him. We have been purchased with His blood. It is, it is as if we are already husband and wife. But right now, at this moment, we reside in two different places. And the ceremony has not yet been consummated. But one day soon, Jesus will return for His bride. And our marriage will be consummated. And we will be with Him forever. Amen. And so Revelation 19 says this, Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And so by review, the church is the new Israel. Now I've added some stuff here, so write it down. The church is the new Israel. That describes our standing before Christ. We're the new Israel. The church is the body of Christ. That describes our mission for Christ. We are to continue to do what Jesus did. And all of us are part of the body of Christ. I got to thinking this morning, based on some of my past experiences, that apparently my part in the body of Christ is to be a hemorrhoid. <laughs> it's kind of a pain in other people's backside. But it's the body of Christ. That's our mission. And then as the bride of Christ, that's our hope in Christ. We will live with him forever. That's the hope that we have. But then fourth is the church is described as an outpost of God's kingdom. And that's our strategic position in the world. Our strategic position in the world. An outpost of God's kingdom. Leading up to the birth of Jesus, the anticipation of the, uh, of the Jewish people that the Messiah would soon appear was at an all-time high. The Jews understood that when the Messiah appeared, he would bring with him the kingdom of God. Immediately following his baptism, Jesus, Jesus said that the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, it's at hand, it's upon us. That's what that word means. Repent and believe the good news. The entirety of Jesus' ministry was summarized by the kingdom of God and how life looked inside this kingdom. It's the upside-down kingdom where the, where the first will be last and the last will be first. He describes to us how, the, how life will look like in that and how life should be lived as kingdom citizens. When, he gave, when Jesus taught his beatitudes, that's the ethics. That's, what, that's how we are supposed to live as citizens of God's kingdom in the here and now. And then in the same way Jesus began his earthly ministry proclaiming the kingdom of God in that same way right before after his resurrection and before his ascension guess what he taught for 40 some odd days The Bible said after his suffering he showed himself to these men his disciples and gave them con convincing proofs that he was really alive and he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Now we are his disciples. 
And the idea of what it means to be his disciples is an apprentice. We are an apprentice. I think sometimes we get the idea that discipleship means another Bible class. But apprentice carries the idea that you've got to get your hands and feet dirty. You've got to not just learn about Jesus. You've got to do the things that Jesus did. You have to train yourself. You're being trained to take over the family business. And so as his followers, we are in training so that we, continue, so that we can continue what Jesus started, preaching and proclaiming the present reality and future hope of God's kingdom. And Jesus even taught us in his prayer. If you read it carefully, he said, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. On earth. As it is in heaven. And we become citizens of God's kingdom the moment we place our faith in Jesus and repent and believe the good news. As citizens of God's kingdom, we are aliens in this world. As a citizen of God's kingdom, something should happen almost every day that reminds you, this world is not my home. I don't fit in. I don't belong here. I'm a misfit. There's something more. It's because you're a citizen of God's kingdom. If you get too comfortable in this world, you might need to check your passport and see where your citizenship really lies. We are aliens in this world. We are immigrants in this world. But we are not alone. God's kingdom is visible in the here and now through his church. And so the church is to be an outpost. The local churches, those are outposts scattered in countless neighborhoods and in countless communities throughout the world. You can go to the most wealthy place in the world and you're going to find a church. And you can go to the poorest places in the world and you're going to find a church. Right? Right? One of my favorite group of churches to work with in Honduras is a group of churches called Noah's Ark. Uh, you can help me, Louis. It's really Arca de Noah, something like that. Is that close enough? Is that close? Did I get that Spanish right? Arca de Noah. But it's called Noah. And at last count, last time I was there, there were 13 of these churches all part of, of Noah's Ark. And they're all called Noah's Ark 1, Noah's Ark, or Arca de Noah Uno, Arca de Noah Dos. That's as far as I'm going. Um, but, you, you know, but 13 of them. And here is the mission of, this, of these churches. The mission of their churches is to find the roughest, meanest, most violent neighborhoods in Honduras where there are no churches. And then they go in and plant a church. Usually it's an ex-gang member that's the pastor. <laughs> But the point being, God has his outpost, local churches, scattered everywhere throughout the world so that the kingdom of God can be advanced. These outposts are to be places in the community where the poor are given hope, the imprisoned are visited and given justice. The broken are sick and healed and made whole, and the oppressed are set free. Now get this, I'm deviating just a little bit, but get this. You guys know uh, that, that over two years ago now, so pre-COVID, we as a church ordained um, Kevin Burns as a minister. He's in our program. He's considered one of our pastors, but he's an inmate on death row. <laughs> he's an inmate, but he's an ordained pastor. And people sometimes, well, why did you do that? And we tell the long story, but post-COVID, I think this is what God had in mind. We were Dane Kevin Burns. He's on death row. He's one of the inmates. We helped him start a church called Church of Life on death row. And then COVID happened. 
and what happened when COVID got here, the prisons across the whole United States, but the prisons across the state stopped all programming. No volunteers were allowed to come inside the church. That meant for a year there, was no, there were no pastors, there were no religious leaders, there were no, no one was going inside any church, in, the, in any prison in the state of Tennessee to hold a church service. But guess what? On death row, there was a church that kept meeting during COVID. So I guess that's why we were dating. We didn't know it at the time, but at least on unit two, there was a church present throughout the entire pandemic. And as far as I know, that was the only church inside of a prison anywhere in the state of Tennessee. Right there. An outpost of God's kingdom everywhere. And so you really cannot go anywhere in the world without finding a church somewhere as this outpost. The, and so these outposts are to be places where, where things like that happen. These outposts, these churches are to be places where the hungry are fed and the clothing are, are given something to wear and the, and the thirsty are given something to drink. The people in these outposts regularly visit the sick and the incarcerated and they welcome the immigrant regardless of their legal standing. We are an outpost of God's kingdom spreading the kingdom of God. Those outposts, local churches, are the hope of the world. And so here it is, the church. The church is people, not buildings or organizations that have been called out and assembled together to proclaim and live out the present reality and future hope of God's kingdom made available through faith in Jesus Christ. The church is described as the new Israel, that's our standing in Christ. The body of Christ, that's our mission for Christ. The bride of Christ, that's our hope in Christ. An outpost of God's kingdom, that's our position in the world. That's the church. You want to, here's, I guess, the question. Have you ever seen a church that resembled the new Israel or the body of Christ or the bride of Christ or an outpost of God's kingdom? They're there, they're, they're out there, but, have, but sometimes they're hard to find. But that's our desire as a church. Our desire as a church is to be a reflection of what God meant the church to be. Now, how do we do that? Well, by following the example of the Church of Acts, which we'll start looking at next week. But it's really right there in our vision statement. Our vision as a church is to enable Middle Tennesseans to experience authentic relationships with God and each other by establishing an Acts 2 biblical community. That's our vision. That's what we're about, or at least that's what we strive to be about. And I believe as we study the church in Acts and apply the principles that we learn from their example, our church will be more and more of an example and resemble more and more what God intended the church to be, the new Israel, the, bride of, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, an outpost of God's kingdom. Because, folks, I'm telling you, it's time for the church to be the church. It's time for us to quit playing games and to quit looking at this as some type of social thing we do on Sunday to make our week go better. But it's time for the church to be the church. Let's pray. As Michael comes to prepare just our song of commitment, before he pray, or before he sings, let's just spend some time in prayer asking God to, first and foremost, to forgive us of our sins. Confess those things that you need to confess. But then also to pray, Lord, what is my role in your church? What is my role? And to realize that no matter what your role is, the foot can't say to the eye, you're not part of me, and the eye can't say to the foot, you're not part of me, but we're all in this together. You are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And each part has a role to play. 
Use this time of prayer to recommit yourself to Christ, to recommit yourself to the church. And say, Lord, what can I do to help FCC become the church that you want it to become? What can I do? So, Father, we love you. Lord, speak to our hearts and continue to speak to our hearts as, as Michael sings for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stay seated, but stay in an attitude of prayer and you can sing or you can just listen to the words of the song. Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Lord, to Jesus I surrender, at His feet I humbly bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, oh, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Let's sing that again. I surrender Oh, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Father, I pray that that is indeed our prayer, that we would surrender all to you and allow you to do your work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me and let's say our prayer together as our benediction. Say this with me. May the light of our Lord Jesus Christ shine brightly in your heart and on your face so that you reflect the glory of God and the good news of the gospel to everyone you encounter. Amen. Have a good week. I dedicate this song to recession, depression, and unemployment.